too. Okay, we're, we're excited to see. I don't know what we do without him. It takes three guys to replace him. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Who here uh, has any experience with game theory whatsoever? Okay. Oh, great. <laughs> Who here has heard of game theory and just wants to know a little bit more? Okay. So we're going to do a quick intro. We're going to do a little bit of theory stuff. Um, it's a little dry in the beginning, and it's going to pick up. And then we're going to see how it applies to us, people, things, the world, money, and blockchain. So what is game theory? Why it's important? Why you should care? A little bit of background. We're going to have some examples. And then how it gets applied to the blockchain and why you should get excited about game theory and, and why it's applicable now. And, and, uh, we're going to talk about how it's gone from something of a very much academic exercise, uh, very theoretical, into something that's hard and, and tangible these days. What is game theory? So a real fun <laughs> definition. The study of mathematical models of strategic interaction between the rational decision makers. Sounds not fun. Um, it says mathematical right there in the title, so you already can tell it's not that much fun. <laughs> But what it can be applied to is just about anything if you stretch it. Um, experiences, fields, it applies to pretty much anything that can act on anything else or has to make a decision. Animals, companies, countries, people, smart contracts, anything that has to make a decision has to think about game theory or game theory applies to them. So um, I don't know if the, that quote is right or not, but sure, it could be. <laughs> and it's uh, sort of a purist form of, of what economics does. So math is the physics, that's game theory is economics. So the things that underpin the economics, macro and micro, kind of can boil down to something in game theory. Just like physics can boil down to some sort of math. Let's take this little square here. Um, sometimes decision make it matrix. Um, I just like to call it decision matrix, and it's pretty simple. It's just one decision that people make all the time uh, about will it rain. This is called decision under ignorance um, because you don't know whether it's going to rain or not. And right now, we don't really know what's the likelihood of whether it's going to rain or not. And, but we have to make a choice. Should we bring an umbrella today or should we not? And depending on whether it rains and depending on whether we bring an umbrella or not, we're going to get some outcomes. So these can be called payouts or outcomes. Payouts, we'll use payouts. So let's say we bring an umbrella and it rains. Okay, sort of a neutral zone. Nothing really good happened or bad happens. You didn't get wet, but that's we just call that a zero, right? Nothing good or bad. Let's say you bring an umbrella and it doesn't rain. Okay, well, you have to carry around this umbrella with no utility whatsoever. So that's, that's a minus one. And then let's say we don't bring an umbrella and it does rain. That's minus five. You get wet, everyone's sad, sad face. Um, what about if we don't bring an umbrella and it doesn't rain? That's also pretty much neutral. So this is a real simple decision matrix. Um, decision on the left, state of the world on the top. So this is a, a single actor. Um, you don't know the state of the world, and we don't know the chances of whether it's going to rain or not. Let's say we just don't have a weather app on our phone or something. It doesn't, we don't have the probabilities. So let's talk about something else called decision under risk. Will it rain? Now we have a weather app on our phone. Congratulations, everybody. We're now in the 21st century. We have a probability of whether it's going to rain tomorrow or today. So now maybe 10% or 90%. What we can do here is do a little math here. Um, and if we add all these up, and, uh, if we multiply the likelihood by the outcome, the payout for the outcome, we can do some little math here and figure out what we should be doing and what the chances are. This is called decision under risk. So we are risk. We know what the, um, the risk is, 90 or 10%, 50-50. Our weather app tells us so we can calculate it. And so we can apply this sort of model to pretty much anything. You can think of a poker hands. If anyone plays poker here or is a gamer or any sort of betting or anything like that, you can think of roulette. Um, you know your chances. Any hands, you've got your flop or whatever they call it. I don't play poker, but people who do, it's the word they use. Uh, you've got a hand, you know your cards, and you know the, the chances of what the other your opponent has in their hands. You don't know what it is, but you know what the chances are. 
So you can do these calculations. So if you want to do some betting, that's a decision under risk. You know what the risk is. So who, heard, who here has heard of prisoner's dilemma? Okay. So this is a multi-agent decision matrix. So what's happening here is um, you and your accomplice are out the bank. And the cops have arrested you and your accomplice. They put you in two separate rooms. And they find in your hideout stolen goods. Now, they can't prove that it was you who stole them. They don't have you on the security camera or your fingerprints. You're a little bit smarter. Um, but they still found the stolen goods in your place. So they can ding you for uh, you know, being in possession or receiving stolen goods. They got you on that. That's good. So that's, let's call that a minus one. So this is, you know, getting punished for stolen goods or holding stolen goods. Yeah, that's one year in prison. But if they can convict you of robbing a bank, that's five years. Um, but here's a little deal, they say. If you rat out your friends, we'll give you zero and they'll get five. And if they both rat out each other, everyone gets minus three. So that's what you got decisions. You've got you and you got your accomplice over there. You can stay silent. The other person stays silent and both gets minus one for receiving stolen goods. That's when you're in prison. If you blame the other one and they stay silent, they don't rat you out, but you rat them out, they get minus five and you get zero. You go scot-free. This is what the, the, the police are offering you or the prosecutor. Uh, and if you both rat each other out, you both get minus three. So this is the prisoner's dilemma. And you kind of want to figure out what's the right way as you, you're on the left, and the other player has the same amount of information as you do. What's the right strategy? And it's really, really hard. This can be played many different ways. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to change some of these numbers around here. We're going to play a different game. So let's play another game called Chicken. So you guys know the game where you've um, got two cars driving at each other. That's a game of chicken. We can put that actually into numbers here. Let's say you, we got the other player. If you both swerve, it's sort of like a neutral. No one really got anything out of the game of chicken. You're both chicken, whatever. Uh, if you stay straight and they swerve, you get plus one and they get minus one. So you were not chicken, they were chicken. Plus one for you, minus one for them. Vice versa for if you swerve and they go straight. But if you both go straight, Minus five for both of you. You get into a head-on collision with another person. So that, by tweaking these numbers, you have a very different, very different game. And so there's strategies to win these games. And the game of chicken is a very interesting game because the strategy to win the game of chicken is to convince the other person that you are absolutely insane. That you will stop at nothing to win this game of chicken. And that playing against you and trying to win by having you swerve will always end in you going straight. So the only options for them is you going straight so they can swerve and get minus one, or they can stay straight and get minus five. You're trying to convince the other player that you're absolutely insane, that you'll stop at nothing. So the way to, way, way to win the game of chicken is to pull off your steering wheel and throw it out the window. Because otherwise, they may be even crazier. If both of you take your steering wheel, throw it out the window, while well, you're both convince each other, you're both just absolutely insane. You both get minus five. So the game of, of chicken is, the way to win the game of chicken is, is uh, convince the other person that you're absolutely insane. So we're gonna go through this example of game of chicken is, is something people use in politics, in, um, you know, betting or anything like that. Convince another person you're absolutely insane. Um, it's a very effective strategy if you can pull it off. The problem is any sort of chink in this armor, if someone's not totally convinced that you're crazy, maybe you're putting out a front, maybe you're just talking game, they mainly think that you're just talking game and they're gonna go and think you might swerve. So that's the game of chicken. Game theory in real life. Um, decisions under risk and decisions on ignorance happen all the time without us knowing it. So people going and just talking to different people or interacting with people, businesses, interacting with other businesses, play the prisoner's dilemma quite often. If you are going to deliver a good 
or if you're going to buy a good from somebody you don't know, maybe think of something like eBay or something like that. If I want to buy something on eBay from someone I don't know, that is a prisoner's dilemma. Will you trust this person to send the thing they're going to do? Will you trust them to wrap you out or not wrap you out? And they're playing that same game with you. Are they going to send the money or not? Or are we going to play this game of, of prisoner's dilemma? If somebody goes first, trusts the other person, the other person betrays that trust by ratting them out, or in this case, not sending the money or not sending the good, that's a prisoner's law. You've got that matrix. And people play it all the time. Um, you play it when you drive your car. Um, is this person, do I trust this person not to pull out into traffic? Uh, do you trust them a little bit? The, the consequences are dire. And we're also all day playing games of chicken, too. If you ever drive your car and then see someone trying to inch out and you hit the gas, sometimes you want them to not think you're a good person, right? You speed up and they're trying to merge in, you hit the gas. You want them to think that you're an a-hole, right? That's a game of chicken. You may have an upper hand and the odds may not be that good or bad because in that game of chicken, if somebody tries to merge into your lane and they hit your car, they're gonna pay for the damage. So that's a sort of an asymmetric game of chicken, but it's still a game of chicken. You're trying to convince this person that you're crazy. It's not worth their time to keep going. Like, play a different game. Choose that game with somebody else, the car behind you. Play with them. So that's a game of chicken. So iterated prisoners lemmas happen all the time. So if you're a business and you've created a relationship with another business, that's an iterated prisoners dilemma. If you are going to play a prisoners lemma with the same group or another actor over and over and over again, there's a strategy to win that prisoners dilemma game. Um, you're going to create a computer program that does it, but in real life, often the time is to uh, not write out the other person. And, and in that box up there, it's usually um, to stay silent and sometimes just called uh, um, collaborate or corroborate um, instead of uh, defect. Um, so if you are a business and you're trying to uh, build that trust with somebody and like, I'm going to send your product if you send me the money. What you do is you do it in little small increments. You know, maybe we'll do one, one shipment. And we'll see how it goes. They deliver it and you deliver it. Okay, good. Let's play this prison dilemma again. Let's raise the stakes. You keep playing this iterated prison dilemma. And if you keep not defecting or, or going and, and grabbing, you know, that, that pot at the end, then people can keep playing it. And so that's sort of a trust relationship people play, but, you know, you don't put a mathematical... Uh, number or square around people's trust, uh, but people do it all the time. Okay, so I have Jason's dollar here. Um, who here has played the dollar auction before? Yes. You have? All right, you don't get to play. We're going to auction off a dollar starting at one cent. And this auction's a little different than other auctions. The highest bidder wins, but the second highest bidder also pays. So, one cent for one dollar. Pretty good deal. Who wants it? Michael, bidding starts at one cent. Who wants a dollar for two cents? A dollar for two cents. It's kind of my dollar, so. All right, two cents. <laughs> the second highest bidder. Second also highest bidder also pays, but they don't get anything. Michael, you're out of cent already. If you spend three cents, bid the three cents, you'll get your money back plus 96 cents. Plus you lose a penny. Well, right now he's losing a penny. He's the second highest bidder. Right. You want to bid him up? Right now you're out well, of cent. Right? Anyone can play. Anyone, you want to, bidding's at two cents right now to Jason. Anyone want to go to three? Well, that's 50 cents. You're 50 cents. <laughs> I'll go to 99 cents. I'll go to a dollar. A dollar. <laughs> All right. Oh boy. A dollar and a cent. A <laughs> dollar and a cent? Oh, no. Go ahead. That's you're out of, you're out of, totally you're right. out of dollar already. You lose 99 cents if you, if you get it. Now you lose one cent. A hundred dollars. A hundred dollars. Whoa. You're out? Oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Do 101? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I won't make you pay up. But we just had an auction where somebody bid $100 for a dollar. That was fun. Stupid. 
<laughs> and the point was the one on one, right? You just bet you bid one dollar and one cent for a dollar. Guaranteed loss. So that's that's a dollar auction. And in that scenario, everybody was acting rationally. You didn't want to lose your money. You didn't want to lose your money. You didn't want to lose your money. No one wanted to lose their money. Each step was rational. We're all playing as rational actors. Not smart, but rational. And so totally rational. You need each step. Each step was like, this is the right move right now. So without any foresight, people are starting to lose money. So that's really interesting because this is sort of a, like a, you know, if you take this game theory thing and sort of like a you know, purist sense and like everyone should do what's the rational thing, the rational actors, people just lost money. People were bidding $100 for a dollar. Not a good idea, right? The majority of the reason is the rational thing you just didn't. <laughs> yeah, right. Didn't at all. So how to win the dollar auction? This is another game of chicken, but it didn't start out as a game of chicken, did it? It started out just a regular auction or an auction with a twist. The best strategy, don't play the dollar auction. That's the only way to win, is to don't play. So the, only, the, the best outcome for the dollar auction with rational actors is zero, is to get nothing out of that game. You can get worse, you can go minus, you can lose money. The best strategy is to do not play. Two. What if you know everybody in the room is really smart and you beat them all to the first bid? How do you know that everyone else is not doing the same thing? You don't. But <laughs> if you can convince them you're crazy. Right. <laughs> exactly. How do you win the game of chicken? Convince anyone that you're absolutely nuts. This man bid $100 <laughs> for a dollar. That seems insane. Okay, so let's go with some blockchain stuff here. So we've got a generic blockchain. This is sort of, you know, pan blockchain logic here. Um, but you can think of it sort of like a like a Bitcoin with um, inputs and outputs where you know one thing can go only, only go to one place. So an unspent transaction can only go to one place. It can't go to both. It's not a ledger with you know um, additions and subtractions. It's inputs and outputs. So a miner controls 5% of hashing power. A miner has received a payment on chain B, fork on chain B. So the fork on chain B and no payment on chain A. So Maybe that unspent transaction went to somebody else on chain A and went to the miner on, on chain B. Um, this decision under, under ignorance, what should they do? Maybe that, um, let's you know, call this bitcoins or something, and, uh, or just you know, units or whatever it is. Maybe they received a payment for 100 on chain B and none on chain A. So with their hashing power, they want chain B to win. Right? Because their their transaction, their money is on chain B. That chain B does not win. Does not win that forking. They're gonna lose money. Or they're just not gonna get their money. So what do they want to do here? The miners' choice is um, to they wanna, you know, just looking at these numbers, mine on chain B, because that's where their money is. Not on chain A, because their money is not on chain A. So they wanna go that. So this is sort of silly, right? I mean, how we get consensus from this. You know, how does other, other miners choose? Um, if we're just going to be selfish, we're just going to pick whatever our payments are. So let's look at something under, sorry. Uh, so if we take, uh, now if chain B is longer, chain A is longer. This is sort of how we get consensus here in a blockchain. Even though the miner has a payment on chain B, they will choose chain A if chain A is longer. Even though their money is somewhere else, they're going to choose chain A if chain A is longer because any power spent, any hashing power spent on chain B, if chain A is longer, will go to naught almost all of the time because the chances of, of them pushing chain B past chain A and becoming the accepted chain is so low because they only hold. 5% of the hash power. And the further along chain A is, maybe it's one block, two block, five blocks, six blocks, their chances of getting chain B ahead become astronomically small. So even though their payment 
is on chain B, they choose to go to chain A. So even people who are, even miners who are incentivized to go to chain B, they will go to chain A. They will forgo, they will forget about their payment, and say, screw it, I'm not gonna waste my hashing power on chain B because it's not gonna go to anything in the chain. So out of this, out of this sort of little game theory box here we've got, we now can get consensus on something. Instead of miners just choosing random chains, whatever they have their payments on, or whatever they, you know, maybe they've got some blocks they, they mined on, we can sort of, a uh, consensus will emerge from chains once one of them wins, even though others are incentivized to go to other ones. So that's a, a quick blockchain miner one. So let's look at some more sort of um, more fun smart contracty things. So Augur, who here has heard of Augur before? Augur is a uh, prediction market. Um, and the way it works is you create a market or prediction. So uh, it's going to rain on a certain day or so-and-so is going to win the Super Bowl or something like that. Um, and then people can buy and sell shares on what they think the outcome will be, whether it's going to rain or something like that. And you can see you know, what the prediction market is of, you know, are the Patriots going to win the Super Bowl? You know, the closer it gets to the date, you know, you set a date at the end, so it's the day after the Super Bowl. You know who's won the Super Bowl. As close as you get to the Super Bowl, it'll predict the likelihood of that according to what people's um, preferences are or thoughts. Uh, and at the end day, after it's um, figured out, an outcome is sort of entered on there. And if that outcome is disputed, they have a rep token. So people with a higher rep can say, you know, the Patriots won or the Bears won. Um, and it's a way of getting outside information onto the blockchain that otherwise you would need something like an oracle for. So if you had like an NFL oracle that told you who was the winner of a, who was the winner of a certain game, and you trusted that oracle, great. But if you don't have that, and you don't really want to use oracles, which have their own problems, you can have something like this to bring outside information onto the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that just make people the oracles, though? Okay. You don't, I, I guess it, Good question. Yeah. So um, let me go and see if I can. So token curated registry. So I'm going to answer that question by talking about token curated registries, which is very similar to what Augur does. So how, here's the problem. How do you get easily agreed upon information to the blockchain? So let's get into the blockchain information on whether Alexander the Great is alive or dead. We know he's dead. The blockchain has no concept of Alexander the Great or death or alive. It doesn't know. It can do math. It's a computer, but it doesn't know about whether people are alive or dead. So how do we get this information onto the blockchain? It's known information. It shouldn't be that hard, right? We can have an oracle for dead people, right? But now we have to trust this oracle. Who runs this oracle? Are they good people? Are they corruptible? It's, it's totally possible. So what do we do? We create this thing called token curated registry. And we make a bet. And everyone says, here's a bet. Uh, Alexander the Great is dead. And everyone gets to bet on whether Alexander the Great is dead or not. And... Whoever wins, whoever has the majority, remember that blockchain can't tell you whether he's alive or dead or not. They can just tell you who the most, the majority votes for, or the, the number of tokens. So we take all these tokens, we'll call them rep tokens, sort of like Augur does. And the number of rep tokens you put in the alive or the, the dead camp, whoever has the most, that's what the blockchain accepts as truth. Alexander the Great is dead, because 99% of the people voted that he's dead. And what we're going to do is all the people who lost that bet, all their rep tokens, all their money, whatever they staked for that goes to the winners. So now you've got a choice. So you're a person who really has a lot of money on him being alive. You want to really like, you have a lot of stuff. You're like, all right, I'm going to, I want, he's alive. I'm going to bet my money on him being alive. Um, but what you're really betting on is whether other people are going to say he's alive or dead. And that's what the outcome is going to be. So what you really should be betting on is what are the other people going to agree upon? And for something simple as this, alive or dead, everyone's going to say dead. So I'm not going to put my money on alive. I'm going to lose all my money. And that's just going to go to the other people. Shoot. So let's say this is weighted based on your stake, how much money you put down as a bet. Mm -hmm. So I have unlimited money, or at least compared to the rest of the group, I have unlimited money. Yeah. Could I very easily then just outbid everybody else and take all their money? Absolutely. 
remember this is public so this is this is done out in the open everyone can see the piles this is not a secret ballot or anything like that sure. if i see you walk into the room and a bet's on the table of whether alexander and the great is alive or dead and you put a bunch of money on our life i am going to scramble to find as many people as i possibly can and say like there's free money in this room just bring your money and we'll we'll double your money i guess what i'm getting after is let's say i've got a billion dollars in the room and uh if if you own yes, if you own fifty one percent of the power, that is is possible. So if if, if we're talking about rep tokens or ETH or something like that, and you own fifty one percent of it, and it's guaranteed that whatever you say is truth, people won't be making bets on Axon the Great alive. Or they'll say that he's alive. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna see whatever you, they're gonna wait for you to yeah. bet. So it is, it breaks down when you have those things, when you have someone who owns 51% of the hashing power. But what I think sort of the, precip the precipice of this is that very few people own 51% of it. And well, any system with some, what the single actor, 51% yeah. is not a valuable system. I know we're talking about maybe niche cases though, it's like little bits where everyone expects it to go one way. Yeah. And then you come and sideline right at the end just like take everybody's money because you have enough resources to manipulate that will. And yeah. Attention to it. And a lot of these will, you know, if we were setting up a TCR and I was worried about that, what I would do is anytime somebody puts down something that increases the pop by 20%, I would push the end date back like a day or something like that. So if like all of a sudden you come in at the 11th hour and you drop, you double it down on he's alive, like that pushes it back. You know, if you double it, that pushes it back a week or something you like that. Your phone with 3D you can, yeah. You so can like pull you out. Bet yes, and then everyone starts bidding. No, you're like, oh shit, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like <laughs> increasingly like the uh, auction that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. potentially. Right. Where, you know. Sure. Um, are the reps then vested in the profit? Um, are they saying the Yeah, you get your reps back. back. So, you know, if you put in 100 reps and the bet, the total summation of the bet was 1,000 reps or something like that, you get your 100 back plus whatever your percentage cut of whatever the losers were. So if 100 people put in for a live, then if you put in you know, 90% or, or, or 20%, you get 20% of the, of the losers bet. So there is incentive for you to go and find these bets where people are screwing up and, and saying, I'm saying the great is a lot. Like, I'll take that bet, like anything. And you'll, you'll make money off the losers. But is a rep then different than a better rep? Yes, so it's staked. So your your rep is you know a size. So if you are put in hundred rep and somebody else puts in five rep, you're twenty times their size. So it's not it's like any other blockchain problem. There's no identity. There's no person. There's no better. It has to be a, a percentage of, of some sort of value. Because as soon as you say better, you you open up yourself to a civil attack and say I can create better. You know, better is just a number on the blockchain. So if the more betters I have, I can. But there has to be some sort of incentive. You know, the token curator registry makes it so that people have to lose money for being wrong. And people have to make money for being right. So now we can make a smart contract, another smart contract, and go out and read that says, is Alexander the Great alive or dead? Now we can write a contract that has brought in outside information into the blockchain. Fuzzy, ugly, meat-driven information. Alexander the Great, alive or dead, blockchain now knows about it. In a way that we can be somewhat sure. Like you said, Dan, like it can be wrong. You can get a bunch of people together in a cabal and say like that represents fifty one percent of the reps and then buy up all the all the losers. It totally can happen. That usually would be the death knell of any sort of token creator registry because now you would not want to use that system. So rational actors will vote for what they think the rest of the other voters will vote for. You get this sort of pile on group mentality, which is good for getting this information out of groups. You know, did it rain yesterday? What was the stock market's closing price yesterday? Remember, this is not a prediction market. I mean, you can try and, and make it that way of whether who's, you know, who's going to win or who's going to lose. But that's a prediction market. You're not curating. You're trying to get information from the outside that people know just into the blockchain. So it's a little bit different. Uh, so less opinionated the options are, the more likely the outcome. Axel the Great, alive or dead, he's evil. Uh, the more fuzzy you get, uh, you know, was today a nice day or not? Like, okay, might be a line somewhere that people could go left or right on it. 
Um, you may be able to win some money or, or not. If you think you can know, if you think you can figure out what other people will vote for. So that's what you're trying to vote here for, or what you're trying to figure out. What do people agree on? So you can do things like top 10 lists or something like that. Um, and you can, you know, massage these, these rewards and punishments to do things. So maybe if you lose, you only lose like 20% of your stake or something like that for a top 10 list, if you're off a little bit. So we can do other interesting things, like what's the price of ETH right now? We can take the price of ETH and put it on the Ethereum blockchain. Right now, Ethereum knows nothing about price. There's no notion of how much does a piece of, piece of Ether cost. Right now, we can make a token curator registry that says, what's the range? And you know, if you're in within a you know, standard deviation or something like that, then you keep your money. If you're outside that standard deviation, you lose your money. So people can take the price of ETH and put it on there. There's other, um, uh, we'll talk about MakerDAO at the end, uh, how they do that. Um, this is sort of a take on that. It, what's your question? FOMO 3D, who played FOMO 3D? Michael was a FOMO 3D fan. FOMO 3D was back, well, it was like end of the summer, I think. Uh, it's a game of chicken. It was a very simple game of chicken. A lot, a lot of sort of stuff around it. Basically the way it works with you buy a key. And the smart contract, whenever they buy a key, the money for that key, or the, for that key goes into a pot. And every time you buy a key, there's a clock. And that clock adds, there's like 10 seconds or 30 seconds or something onto it. And if the clock ever reaches zero, the last person who put their money in gets the whole pot. So, Plugging it in, plugging it back in. So yeah, FOMO 3D was sort of at the end of the summer, and, and the idea is you have a countdown clock, and whenever the countdown clock hits zero, whoever was the last person to buy a key is the winner, and they get the whole pot, and that pot was every other person who bought a key. There's a bunch of other stuff around, and just teams, and you know, a little more gaming stuff, and some fun little things, but it was essentially that. Um, and it's a game of chicken. It's actually an iterated game of chicken, um, which is really interesting. Um, if you're going to play chicken with somebody else over and over and over again, you have to be completely and utterly crazy to win. So you have to convince people over and over and over that you're absolutely insane, and that you have either the insanity, and in this case, the money to keep going. So at the end of it, you don't know what other people have in their wallets. Um, I don't know if we get, we get projector. What? Oh, the. And so, uh, FOMO 3D had a website that sort of um, showed what people were doing and gave you updates and stuff like that. And they had a little ticker on there. People could post messages. And a lot of the messages sort of ended up just threats to other people. <laughs> uh, basically saying, like, I have this amount of money and I am willing to spend it on this game. Forever. I am absolutely not. Sorry. People would write this on this little ticker, this little message thing, just like a little troll box. <laughs> they would just say, like, I'm going to spend all this money on it. Like, stop playing. You did, will lose. Did anybody, like, digitally sign proof that they have money? I, I bet they, I don't know if they got to that far, but that would be a great strategy. Yeah. They're like, look, look at this account. I have this much money. I am going to win. Unless you have more money, like, you're not going to win. Yay. So that's an iterated game of chicken. And the stakes keep going up. This pot keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and attracts bigger and bigger and crazier and crazier people. So you need to convince everyone to not join this game. Like the dollar auction. Convince people not to play. You have to be the only player. And say like, here, 
I am crazy. I'm going to bid one cent, and I'm also going to keep bidding up until $101. And if no one wants to enter that game because they are guaranteed or they're convinced that they will only lose. And if you buy a key and you don't get, if, you don't, if you're not the last key buyer, you get zero, nothing. So a lot of people played the game of chicken and lost. No, no, I think, um, and it didn't end up as like a person, just like a last man standing, it ended up being a, a gas attack or a block, or a block stuffing attack. <laughs> So we never really got as a game theory nerd. I really wanted to see like where like the like the culmination of it. What would end up being the end of the game of chicken? Make sure we're okay with time. Uh, it was we never really got there, and it's sort of like it also requires a lot of publicity. So if like no one's really playing, it's not that interesting. But if everyone's like watching this, it can it can be really uh, really interesting. So there's some costs. I don't know why. FOMO three D. Fear of missing out. Yeah. Three dimensional. <laughs> Yeah, it would, degree. The yeah. folks who did it were tongue in cheek with a lot of stuff. Um, so when you sink money in, so say you're playing this game of chicken, you've already keep buying keys, right? You keep get, gets low, and you want to be the last person to buy a key. Then it keeps going, and then somebody else bought the key. So like, oh crap, now I got to play again. So you have more and more sunk costs, and the more sunk costs you have, the more you have to sink more to get that sunk cost out. How are the keys? Done? You just buy it, just hit the smart contract and send it ether, and it puts you as the last man. Oh, okay. It's not like a, I, it's not like a private no. key or anything. No, no, no. I don't know why they call it key, but it's just basically, you, right. just, you just put your name on the top of the pile, yeah. and it costs you money each time you do it. So the last man on the, on the, on the top of the pile was the winner. Um, so there's other strategies. So maybe you're crazy, but you're running out of money. Another person, you know, maybe they don't have as much or something. You can team up. And say like, oh, we're going to pool our money together to play this game of chicken, so that we can beat another person. So if people could team up, you could pool your money together and then split the winnings, or something like, like you do for a lottery pool or something. Um, okay, so that's FOMO 3D. What else we got? Maker DAO. So Maker DAO is, as far as I know, the only non purely game theory crypto backed stable coin. So what they have, and we could spend hours and hours and talking about MakerDAO, figure out how it works. It's super complicated. Um, it's super interesting. If you really like this stuff, MakerDAO is basically like whoever like just went nuts with game theory and economics and decided that like, okay, I'm just gonna make it all. And, and so far it seems to work. The, the peg at about, about $1 mostly works. And the way it works is you can buy a CDP, a collateralized deposition. You take your ether, say you've got 150 bucks worth of ether. What you can do is you can open this position, this debt position. You put it in a contract and you get back 100 die. And we know it's 100 die or $150 worth because they have a price oracle. And that price oracle is, is what um, sort of underpins a lot of this stuff. And they have, I think like, 12 or 13 sort of like trusted oracles that put the, uh, the ether price about every hour or so into a smart contract. And these CDP smart contracts read that, that ether price. And they just take the median of that ether price and they assume that is the ether price. So what happens here is you create a CDP, you get reward for die. You lock up your ETH, 150 bucks for the ETH, you get 100 die back. If you want to collateralize at 150%. So that's how you would do something. And the collateralized depositions are not new. People use them all the time. Banks use them for stuff. Do you to need to choose what, how, how collateralized you are? Yes. Yeah, you can do like 300% or 200%. The interesting thing is that the ether price, the ETH price goes up and down. So if you're collateralized 150%, in that smart contract, that is, is specified. It says this deposition is collateralized at 150%. And what's happening is that Keepers, these people sort of grabbing through the smart contracts, finding CDPs that have dropped below that. So if the Ether price, you know, uh, drops below that, uh, so that your collateralized debt is no longer 150% of 100 bucks, these keepers can sort of hit something on this smart contract and uh, liquidate it, and they'll get money for it. What they do is basically they get the starts an auction basically for this, and they get 
they can buy it at a discount um, minus what's called a stability fee and um, a penalty fee. So you, if you were your own keeper, you wouldn't want to be your own keeper. You wouldn't want to liquidate your own contract because you would only get like 130% of, or like 80% of whatever you want, whatever was collateralized. So you only get 80% of the ether. So you can't just buy it and then sell it on the, on the market and get 100% of what the ether was in there. It goes into like a, another pool. Do you know who gets funds? Whoever, who gets the funds? The, the, like that differential. What is that like? Interesting that question. So that differential um, goes into something called uh, PEF, which is P-E-T-H, um, which is a pool that is basically something that can buy other debt positions. So people can spend that to buy other collateralized debt positions to prop up the peg. So that money goes into a pool that people can use to buy other debt positions. And there's also stability fee. So if you, at the end of it, you're like, okay, I want to close out my debt position. You have to bring your collateralized, your, the money the money you got for the collateral back to get your collateral back. That's how any sort of collateral would work. Uh, minus what's called a stability fee. And so stability? Uh, it goes... Say, make sure I understand is that, this is right. That how they, is that rent rent you, it, no one gets it. No, okay. no one gets it. What happens is that die gets burned. So okay. basically, if the, if the stability fee was 1%, yeah. you have to, and you got 100 die for a contract, you need to bring back 101 die to buy it. So what's happened now is you've got 100 die, 100 die was made, yeah. and now you have to buy 101 die. So somewhere you have to go find one die out of nowhere, and you have to go to the market and find someone who's selling die and say, I want a die. So all of a sudden, this stability fee sort of underpins a lot of the, that peg stability. That's why it's called that. Um, so that it creates demand where there was no supply. So if we increase the stability fee, say like, okay, to get back your 150 bucks worth of die that you got 100 die for, and it, the stability fee is 7%, you need to bring back 107 die. So that's like, it's an interest rate on your, on your collateral. Any sort of debt would have that. But you have to go and find seven die somewhere. You have to go to the market. Someone's selling seven die, and you have to buy it. So we've created, by increasing the stability fee, we've increased this, this uh, demand for die. So now we can push up in the market um, what the stability, what the, um, the price of die would be. And if it's dropping down, we can increase the stability, the stability fee. What's up? Who gets to set the stability How does that get voted on? It's a little fuzzy. The maker, so there's also another token called maker, MKR, yeah. and the maker holders can vote to increase or decrease the stability fee. And these maker um, token holders are incentivized to keep the peg at a certain um, at $1. So they want to keep the stability fee, keeping that peg right at close to $1 as they can. So it all sort of under, underpins it. So you can, vote up and down. they can vote the stability fee up and down. Okay, like a pseudo centralized bank for it's a pseudo, it's a sort of decentralized voting bank right. thing. And for the past like year or so, it's mostly worked. Uh, and so, and you can also, so I was just saying, one of the interesting aspects here though is unlike the Fed, who just decided to do the stuff with no skin the game, Maker does have skin the game. So if they do poorly, they lose money. So Maker gets burnt to try and fill the gaps to make, uh, to restore the peg. Yeah. So, they're incentivized very actively to make sure the peg is solid. Otherwise, nobody nobody would want maker tokens, and their maker token, the people who have staked a maker token, would lose all all the money they've invested in maker tokens. So they're incentivized they to keep TCR on this instead. So interestingly, you know, one option for the ETH price would be a, a, a TCR, something like that. Instead of having a couple of trusted people who are or are feeding the smart contract with updated prices. You make a TCR that says, I'm going to stake some maker token or some ETH that the price is between <coughs> these two things. You're guessing, the You're guessing what everyone else is going to put in there. And everyone, if everyone 100% vote for the same thing, you get all your money back out. Yeah. Is there any reason you couldn't just stake your uh, trusted people? Stake to get somebody else to be the trusted uh, person? Or just to have a way to punch them if they're wrong? That's how a TCR would work. So say you're... You're right, part of the right, TCR. I'm saying like less or more uh, like take your scheme with your oracles, just like some yeah. fixed set of oracles, but then make sure that they are staked. 
Yeah, you could do that. Smart contract could know that. And make sure that like to be part of this oracle, you have to lock up a certain amount. Just needs to be a punishment. Yeah. That if they if they put in a, a a really off price, that they lose money. So you could do that. Yeah. Definitely like that. You know, in in my med, I you have like a range. So whoever you know, if somebody's more than a standard deviation away, they would lose that stake. And what you want to do as as a participant in that TCR is you want people to screw up. You want someone to like be asleep at the switch or have their server go down. And or like have them get bad data because they're going to stake. You know, if, if the price is 150 and they put in 135, and they're more than one standard deviation away than everyone else is, you get all their stake. Everyone else is participating; they get their stake. So you're incentivized to keep it as tight as possible and get to as close as what you think everyone else is going to put in there. Remember, you're not trying to be right; you're just trying to be agreed upon. It's like a relative reality. Yeah. Trying to guess what reality, what everyone else thinks reality is. Yeah. It, it sounds like basically the goal of this then is to really make a game of chicken like scenario such that once you're in, you can't stop. Everybody's got to keep pushing to make it work. Yeah. And if anyone drops, the whole thing blows up. Right. Yeah. But you want to play because you think somebody else is going to drop because there's money in it. Shoot. Where does X die? Because I know that's a part of the system. I think that's for the POA network. I think is that right? Yeah, it's a side chain. Oh, so it actually has their. Actually, I, I just became a, a XDAI validator. So uh, it has shorter block times, and so uh, it's just five seconds instead of fifteen. But it's like a synthetic asset, so it's not die. It's X die. You can you you lock up die to get X die, and then you're trusted with a set of validators, and they they. It's a, a proof authority network yep. where uh, blocks are mined every five seconds, so it's just faster. And then when you want to exit, you burn your X dot, and then you can get the quick time. Yeah. So, so uh, it's not on the mainstream, right? So, um, so it has the advantage of cheaper transactions. Uh, so it's die on the mainstream. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's so it's like it seems like a, yeah. No. It's like you gotta have E to get maker and. And at you East Denver, need, we had Buffer die. Right. Yeah. Like one need, more step after that. You don't need uh, maker tokens to buy die, but maker tokens and die are coupled in such a way that they work together. But you don't need a maker to get die, but you need die to get die. And you can buy die just on an exchange too, like you would for any sort of ERC twenty. It's an ERC twenty token. So game theory shortcomings. Um, one, you know, those examples were super discreet, but a lot of times, lots of people playing different games. Prisoner's Llama, Chicken. So you have to have someone join the game to be interested in the game. So if your game is set up that everyone who joins loses, no one's going to play your game. That's not a very interesting game. So you're not the only game in town. People get to choose, uh, and often humans are at the wheel, um, and they are pretty terrible at cold calculated decisions. Um, and casinos and lotteries are proof. People, yeah, whole towns are built on, on 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 proof that the odds are against you, and people don't believe it. Um, and information is almost never perfect. So, if you're playing those those games of chicken or prisoner's dilemma, and you can see that nice board with the numbers, that's real easy. But sometimes uh, information is asymmetric, and people have more information than you do, and like the FOMO 3D game, if you have information that you don't think other people have, you can bet and you can play with that knowledge. You may be wrong, but you know that's something you can use to your advantage. So who's seen the movie Dr. Strangelove? This is a, that was a big game of chicken, where the, the, the Russians had this doomsday device that they had set up and they turned on, and that, that anybody set off an atomic bomb, it would blow up the Earth. That was, that was the scenario by, by Drangel. The problem was that they didn't tell anybody. They were going to do a big reveal like a week later. <laughs> it was supposed to be on like, you know, the premier's birthday, I think it was the line. Um, and so Dr. Strangelove is the guy who's like explaining this. is like, oh, I see what you're doing here. That makes sense. Except you didn't tell anybody. So no one plays, if you're not, if you don't know you're playing a game of chicken, 
and you start playing that game, everyone, and you continue and you don't swerve, everyone loses. So these scenarios, you know, that's a good uh, situation where like, you gotta tell people you're playing the game of chicken. And if you tell people you're crazy, but you're not playing a game of chicken, everyone's gonna lose. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, there's, there's shortcomings. So it's nice theoretical and everything's perfect, but as soon as you put in humans, um, information asymmetry, things don't work out in a mathematical perfect sense. So it's, it's nice to tweak these things and, and lay it out there, but sometimes people just don't wanna play your game. Questions? I have also a couple more examples if you guys want to see some examples. Um, if we have time. Do I have time for like maybe a couple more minutes? 713? Game theory in real life. Climate change. Decision under ignorance. Let's take this. So those two, two states of reality. Either humans affect climate change or humans don't affect climate change. And the humans have a choice. Limited emissions or don't limit emissions. What should we do? So in this scenario here, there's a possibility if we don't limit, we'll get minus 100. Uh, that could be, you know, all the terrible things of climate change come through. Sea, rise, sea levels rise, you know, people displaced, general misery, very, very bad. If we limit emissions and humans affect climate change, we're minus 10. So we, you know, we forego some wealth, we leave it in the ground. We're not able to further certain, you know, uh, industrial decisions. Um, so that's a minus 10. Um, and if humans don't affect climate change, that's sort of the same thing. Um, nothing happens, but we missed out on opportunity. And if we li uh, don't limit and humans don't affect, um, things just sort of go on. So that's the neutral. That's right now. You know, we don't know more, no less. Why wouldn't the top right be like minus 110? <laughs> humans don't affect climate change. Um, Is it? If they, oh, oh, are you saying they don't affect climate change? Climate, climate happening. change is not real. Okay, that graph right. that goes up to the right is going to go down to the right. Got it. It was just a blip. So, so how, how is how is that different than like the whole like tragedy of economists, where it's like everyone knows that that would be a decision on a on a personal level. And that's a, that's a good, that would be a good square to figure out. And what you would see is that your, your as an individual, your decision to not take oil in the ground and sell it um, would help people, everybody a little bit, lots and lots of people a little bit, yeah. and you very little. Right. You would be minus, if you took that out of the ground and sold it to somebody and they burned it, and that, CO, that carbon goes into the air, you would make a lot of money. Big up for you, small down for everybody else. So the summation of all those downs would be much higher than your up. Right. So it would be negative for the group, the commons. Is that so, a game of chicken then? Well, I'm like, I'm just like... I think that's that is sort of like its own game. Is is yeah. just the tragedy of the commons is sort of like, and that's sort of how it is, and that's which is why you have to have. Uh, if you group everyone else together as like the commons, though, isn't it a prisoner's dilemma? It's actually, um, we can get more theoretical, but it would be uh, closer to a Nash equilibrium or a shine point. Yeah. So what the decision is that you have to get people together and decide to not do something. So we have to get everyone this together. And this is sort of why it's hard, is you have to get everyone to agree to upon the thing, to coordinate and say, yeah. we're all not gonna do this thing. So we all don't get large negative. But if one person does it, everyone gets a negative, and that one person gets. It's misaligned incentives, though. Yes, which is why it's such a difficult problem. So if we go and we look here, so now we have, a, we have now let's put this decision under risk. So same square, but the probabilities have changed. Um, I think it was ninety-seven percent of climate scientists agree that. Humans are affecting the climate through C, through carbon emissions. Uh, so let, if we add those numbers here and we do some math over here, the limit option for humans, minus 10, doesn't really change anything. Still minus 10, minus 10. But the don't limit is minus 96.7 if we 
add these up. And so if you were doing some sort of just like game of roulette or poker hands, what you would do is you take all your odds for the thing winning and your odds of the thing losing and how much it costs and add up those odds. Take the odds and multiply it by how much the winnings would be. It's a very simple, same thing for lottery. Um, and this is how it would work. So now with the decision under risk, this climate change option, um, it's, it's much more attractive to limit emissions because they're, they're, the probability, if you add them all up, is minus 10, but don't limit is 96.7. So that's a real-life example of, of game theory in you know, a, a thing that people are facing. But like you said, it's a tragedy of the common. So everyone has to make the same choice. All the, the human choice has to be one thing. Because if one group or individual decides that, no, I'm not going to limit, I'm going to push as much carbon into the atmosphere as I can because that will benefit me, then we end up with that. So that's why it's a, that's why it's a tough problem. Cool. Um, I'm going to lose money. I'm going to get minus five. I'm going to put my money into something that has no return on it. Would, that, would you call that a shelling point? Yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of a, a good shelling point in, in, of like you, there's a point where everyone just agrees that this is the best thing for themselves and for the group and to do that thing. And once you hit, hit that point, sort of a tipping point, everyone just sort of goes to that thing. It happens every time there's a block. Every 10 minutes on the Bitcoin chain, everyone takes that. So that's what, what the equilibrium part is, yeah. where you have the, the self-interest and the group interest kind of aligned. Yeah. The, the interests of the individual and interests of the group become the same. They become and they sort of agree to do this thing. They, they, everyone agrees that this is the best interest for themselves, which happens to be, and this is set up in that way, that the interest for yourself, everyone came to the same conclusion. Consensus. So how do we solve the climate change? <laughs> that's the problem. I, that's, this tell, that's what this tells you is that like you can't for, the, for this. Because as soon as you get one person to make that, or one group to make the, the choice to be greedy, which is, you know, in the, in the game theory way, there's not, an op, there's not a way to fix it. Yeah. Like, you have to go outside game theory, and which is why it's really hard, which is why a good proof that, like, game theory is relevant and real is that, like, we haven't figured out climate change, even though we should. Like, it's a serious problem that's going to affect us all in, like, a really massive way. Yeah. And we're doing nothing. We're not choosing to do it. <laughs> You know, there's different options for doing this. You know, it's like uh, carbon credits or you know carbon tax. That all changes this algorithm. That like if I all of a sudden pulling you know carbon out of the ground and putting the atmosphere, if I tax it, you know, then that changes the numbers. Like oh, no longer worth it to take it out of the ground and put it in the air because it's that's going to cost more money. Or I'm not going to make as much money as I could be doing something else with those resources. So you're limiting that short-term incentive to align it more with the long. You're, yeah, so it's just a solution, just like any other strategy, the commons problem is you have to tax the, the commons. If you want to take your sheep and eat in the commons, you have to pay a tax. And you have to increase that tax until as few people are taking their sheep to the commons as the commons can sustain. Right. So you, you have to, uh, it's, it's, it's just externalities, negative externalities that nobody else is paying. You now have to tax those negative externalities to bring that back to, to, you know, you tax the thing you don't want to happen and you, uh, you know, pay for the thing you want to happen. So until those things happen, you still, you're going to end up with this. And you, people just make the same choice. People, and, and the further you get away from individuals, the closer you get to rational decision actors. So a group or a company makes rational decisions. An individual, fuzzy, but a company or a country, they make rational decisions almost always. You know, you, when you average all these things out, they sort of end up at a rational decision, and, and it's, it's those things. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.